Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about addiction in, in the United States with our guests. Candace Hodgkin, CEO of Gateway Community Services in Jacksonville, Florida. Gary Mandel, founder and CEO of Shadowproof in New York City. And Evita Morin, CEO of Rise Recovery in San Antonio, Texas. We will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. Thank you all for joining us. It's just wonderful that you're here to talk about uh, addiction. Um, we took a look at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and there are about 20 million or about 6% of Americans over the age of 12 battle substance use. And so let's talk about how this manifests in these various regions we have Florida, we have uh, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, the heart of Texas. We have uh, New York City. Uh, Candy, let's start with you in, in Florida. How does, how does addiction manifest in your region? Uh, well, first, let me thank you very much for having me here today. And I'm very wonderful to be with Gary and Vita, colleagues in our addiction services um, protocols. So in Florida, um, the opioid crisis that uh, started back in uh, 2016 has really hit us hard. And so I would say opioids is the major drug in um, the state of Florida as well in, as in Jacksonville, followed by alcohol, cocaine, and then marijuana. So we're trying to deal with it the best way we can. My organization, uh, Gateway Community Services, has been in Jacksonville for the last 40 years. And uh, we treat adolescents and adults, and we have a, a comprehensive program uh, that goes from detox all the way to recovery program with all the services in between. So uh, we treat about, oh, 5,000 or more individual people a year, and uh, that equals about 190,000 services um, across the board. So our job and our mission for Gateway is to help people with addiction to coping mental health disorders. And it's a big job and we're successful, but it takes a lot of work and not everybody is successful as anybody who's in the addiction field knows. Um, we suffer from people who are unwilling to get treatment or somehow for whatever reason, they just can't get it um, and either end up using again or you know, perhaps dying, which is what the opioid crisis has really increased in our community. And I think what's so frustrating about drug use in the United States is that so much of it is part of a business model that leads into addiction, right? Particularly the opioid uh, arena has, has received a lot of press coverage, but alcohol is also a business model that leads to addiction. And uh, some of these other um, drugs that end up becoming uh, real problems start off as over-the-counter medication and then are, are manufactured into, into other um, uh, issues. Gary, how, do you, how are you finding this in New York? How, how are you experiencing this uh, epidemic? Is it also opioids as, as it is in Candy's uh, area in Jacksonville? Let me start out by saying that uh, my organization, Shatterproof, is less focused on a particular area. Um, and we are in the New York area, our, our corporate office, but we're, we're doing work all over the country. So it's really nationally the way I'm looking at it. And so if I can answer for that, nationally, there's no question that the opiate epidemic continues to rage, and tragically. Um, other substances, including alcohol and all other substances, are also be more in use now than they ever have been. You know, in the month of May, there was data that showed that overdoses across the country, back to the opiate epidemic for a second, overdoses across the country were 42% higher than they were May 2019, month over month, year over year. 42% 40, higher. 42%. And that is, before I even saw that data, or I'm sure Candy or Avita or, or any of us saw that data, we all expected it. I mean, with the opiate epidemic, Think about the social isolation that people who are addicted feel. So much worse for them than, or someone with mental health issues. It's hard for everyone, 
but think about someone who has mental health and or addiction issues, the impact on them. Think about the impact of the anxiety that comes with worrying if you're gonna lose your job or if you lose your job, how am I going to live or eat? The anxiety that comes with that. Um, can, I get, can I get to my treatment program? Can I go to AA meetings or NA meetings? I know a lot of them are through Zoom now, but I just spoke to someone this morning who said, it's just not quite as good. You know, we've had half a dozen overdoses over the last six months in my, net, my greater network here in the New York area related to, you know, I don't know that it would have been zero a year ago, but it was clearly more now than it was a year ago. And the interaction between stress, right, trauma, mental health uh, issues. And, and we, we talk about mental health. We all live with mental health issues. And it's really a question of, of how do we deal with it? And sometimes self-medication is the exit uh, from, from that, that trauma, temporary, but it has amazingly poor impacts on us. Evita, are, are you finding that uh, as well, that the stress of the COVID situation, as Gary said, the threat of losing jobs, the social isolation, is this also what you're encountering in San Antonio? Sure, I think, I think nationally, we're all seeing that isolation has a negative impact on mental health and behavioral health, that um, loss of income has a negative impact on mental and social health. And as a result of that, I think uh, I see people uh, either relapsing or introducing drugs or alcohol to uh, placate their nerves and their um, circumstantial depression or anxiety, but also um, you know, losing hope and having quite a bit of despair uh, around the, their own futures. And so we do see that in San Antonio as well as you know, throughout our communities. Um, I think in San Antonio, our biggest challenges, and I, I, you know, I can't speak for other communities, but I do see a, I, I would, I would guess that there's some parallels that uh, the behavioral health system is disjointed. Um, you know, I can go into a hospital for any number of ills, my physical health, and I know I'll be treated, but if I may not be using the type of drug that this, uh, you know, a treatment facility works with, or uh, I might not be the right gender, I might not be uh, the right age. And so there are so many limitations with access to care uh, that, that create these silos and make it very difficult for people to receive help that need it. And so there is that gap in our community. There's also an overwhelming neglect of youth uh, who, have, who are struggling with substance use disorders or misuse. I think we are past the point of, uh, I think we all recognize that just say no is missing something, but we haven't really replaced that well enough with uh, just say no, K N O W to the people that are that are youth that are already engaging in drugs and alcohol. We need them to understand their the impact of their choices. We need to acknowledge that they're already making those choices, and that those and that the likeliness that they're doing it right now with um, idle hands is increasing. And uh, I think that we are we're in a place where we have to face that reality. That you mentioned uh, age twelve around age twelve is when this starts. And yet, oftentimes, we're not addressing it until well after they're in their late 20s, their early 30s. That's much too late, and we need to be addressing it much sooner. There's also this, this really interesting dichotomy. Um, we just completed a poll in which we said, do you consider drug and alcohol use and dependency to be a treatable disease with the implication that it is a disease? And 87% of the people believe that it was a disease and treatable. Um, there are a few people who were not sure and a few people who, who didn't believe that. But let's say it, it is. There, there is this disparity between the kind of, of treatment that insurance will cover and that we are set up to provide. There is very often no integrated approach in which you have both the, um, the physical and the mental health aspects treated in a holistic way. So sometimes the treatment for the physical ailment can result in the prescription of, of a substance that uh, can tip into addiction. How do you see the changes that society needs to make in order to place addiction front and center with other ailments, whether physical, a broken arm, or mental health, 
very obvious mental health issues. How do we actually deal with this and remove the stigma and start to treat our friends, our family, and our fellow citizens? Uh, Candy, you want to give a, give a uh, cut on that? Or, or Gary, Avita? Um, sure, I'll start. Um, you know, stigma is the uh, obstacle, the biggest obstacle that we've always had with treating mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and, you know, breaking down the stigma chipping away. We're doing a good job. It's better than it was 10 or 15, 20 years ago, but we're not there yet. And we need to educate and keep um, sounding to our legislators that these disorders are needed to be treated just as all physical and that they should all be treated together and treatment should not be something that people have a difficult time accessing. Um, and that the reason, you know, the 12 year old um, and teenagers are, you know, teenagers are going to experiment. But the reality is in our families, it's still a stigma to talk about it. You don't want your child to have a substance use or mental health disorder. And so the denial is very strong. And that, that also adds to the difficulty in breaking it down. So it really just needs to become a, a, a national effort, a statewide effort to break the stigma so that people know it's okay to get help. Ask for help early. Teach your children about substance use and mental health disorders. All mm -hmm. mental health stuff. Does, does stigma have a business use for, um, uh, we, we're talking about a field where people earn a lot of money and coverage, insurance coverage is expensive. Care is expensive and profit is so often or at least a positive cash flow is so often the priority. Does stigma actually have a use in that you keep a certain amount of very expensive care off the market because it's difficult to fund? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, Shatterproof is working on, our work is, all our work is centered around three pillars, if you will. The first pillar, and you've touched upon it, Mark, and uh, obviously, and, and so did uh, Candy and Avita, is the treatment system in the United States is not where it needs to be. So that's pillar number one, transforming the treatment system in the United States. Two, pillar number two, is we, we need to remove the stigma associated with this disease, those who have this disease, and the medications that treat this disease. And number three, we need to provide information and support and resources to families so they can understand this disease and have the information at their fingertips. All three of these, I'll add a few words, just like any other disease. And so to transform the treatment system in the United States, and all of you have touched upon it in the last few minutes, is we need one, we have a five point plan to do so, which we're leading around the country. Number one, one national standard of care. And there are dozens of evidence-based practices, but what we did three years ago was boil it down to less than 10 core principles of care that should be reflected in any treatment program in the United States, whether it's alcohol or opioids, whether it's adolescent, adult, whether it's residential or outpatient, eight principles of care, which we published three years ago and have gained broad industry acceptance around the country. And, and it absolutely encompasses what Candy and Avita have said. You know, coordinated care, not just treating you for addiction, but also mental health and physical issues. Um, there's eight principles of care and it's on our website. So that's number one. Number two, we need to get people to treatment programs, excuse me, we need to publish on an annual basis the quality that's being delivered at treatment programs tracking, crosswalking consistency with our principles of care and get that information out transparently to payers, consumers, to states, all three of which will dr drive demand to the higher quality treatment programs, which will, uh, Adam Smith, you know, very simple, the invisible hand, if demand is driving from consumers, payers, and um, states to higher quality care because the information is transparent it will absolutely increase the quality of care and also Gary, given, what happens if, if but also given that, that information to providers to treatment programs so they can learn from each other 
I mean, I just want to just say one last point on this is my experience in the field with my son. And then since then, most, you, you, you read the articles about unscrupulous treatment providers. That's the, that's the rarity. Most people in this field are wonderful people trying to help people. The field was behind in giving quality information out of what should be delivered. There's a lot of old beliefs. And if we can get this information out, as I said, to payers, states, and consumers to drive demand and information out to providers so they can benchmark against each other and learn from each other, the whole treatment system will improve. And that's what we're doing. We just launched a quality measurement system a month ago. I'm sorry, Mark, go ahead. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm sorry for interrupting you. Um, the, the reason that I, that I um, was so bold to do so is that third point that you mentioned, which is the resource point. Because Adam Smith kind of breaks down when there are no resources that can inform the market. The market is great where resource, in other words, money, becomes the communication mechanism for it to align itself. But we already know that the need is so intense, particularly amongst communities that, that uh, suffer a lot of uh, trauma through poverty or, or transgenerational economic dislocation, often communities of color. So the, the demand is, is, is manifestly there, has been for decades, but the resources haven't been. And so the market doesn't organize, that, that organizing principle that you point out, it doesn't organize around people who, with no resource. How do we deal with that? Uh, you know, we, we do have this, the government response pejoratively referred to as, um, as income redistribution. Right. How, do we, how do we deal with that in a way that does create that one standard, uh, does allow people who have addiction but no resource to, to find treatment? Um, and and I, don't, um, I don't have an answer. Um, well, I do. I mean, it depends. When you say resource, are we talking about dollars or are we talking about information? So let's dollars. talk about, okay, dollars. Yeah. Okay, so dollars reality is is most people in this country that the vast majority are on health insurance or medicaid health insurance and the, the the little secret here it's not much of a secret but the fact is that treating some a, a patient with quality care is much less expensive to a payer and insurer whether it's medicaid or commercial than have, have someone treated a treatment program that is not delivering treatment based on evidence-based practices. And so it's much less expensive, not more expensive. And so if we can get this information out, not if, we're doing it right now, we just launched it in six states and it's now expanding to other states. Get this information out to families so they can see where to go or they go to their insurance company that has network information who's covered and if payers are using our information to help in their decision of who's in their network or not, it's going to lower cost. It's not going to increase cost, lower it dramatically. And we have data that shows it. So this is not a dollar issue. This is a information issue. And so getting this information right now on our website, anybody in the country can go and learn, any patient or family member can go on our website on atlas, at treatmentatlas.org and learn about what you should be looking for in a treatment program. And then if they happen to be in one of our, the six states that we have quality information, they can just click a button and see all the quality information. They don't have to ask and figure it out. It's all there. Vita, what are your observations on this issue? Is it, is it in your area in terms of ensuring that, that people organize around effective treatment? Is it an information uh, issue? Is it a resource issue? Is your... Is your... Thank you. Uh, what, what, what I've been thinking about in this conversation is that there are, yes, there is stigma and there's, uh, you know, questions about whether or not, or perspectives about whether or not it's a disease or it's a moral failing, all of that to me matters less than that addiction is an underlying cause of so many social ills that our communities are interested in changing. And they may not be interested in changing, interested in changing addiction, but I know they're interested in changing family violence rates. I know they're interested in changing 
uh, student success. I know they're interested in changing uh, so many other uh, homelessness and, and drugs and alcohol continue to be risk factors for all of these things. And so I think it's changing the conversation in some ways and ensuring that people are aware that addressing addiction with evidence-based practices will result in better outcomes for quality of, of life in our communities. And I also think that we're not just disjointed on the, on the, the ground, but also in the conversations around behavioral health and mental health. I continue to find myself in rooms that are strictly behavioral health people, the, the other addiction folks, and then people in the mental health field as though they are not the same. And trying to bridge that gap and add behavioral health to every mental health conversation, and particularly youth mental health uh, conversations, is a critical game changer in us having what we need at RISE Recovery to get the resources to the youth that we serve. At RISE, our focus is on youth and adults and families because that's where it starts. Time and time again, data supports that if we address this and not just try and prevent it from ever happening, but admit that it's happening and work on with youth who are already engaging in drugs and alcohol and adults, we will reverse so many social ills uh, for that generation to come. And so our focus is on that through, uh, through the use of peers. I'm very curious, Gary, what kind of, what's your pillars? I'll, I'll be looking into those because our work is, I'm a social worker by trade and, um, I think uh, where I found really incredible motivating um, factors for change for the people that we serve was in having a trained, licensed person with shared experience walk along and create that navigation, create that uh, that hand-to-hand -hand transition to continuum of care, and that support that's uh, missing in a highly stigmatized uh, disease. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Well, just to add one point, you mentioned a couple times highly stigmatized disease. First of all, I agree with you, everything you said 100%. Um, but if I can pick up on your comment about highly stigmatized disease, this is not rocket science to reduce the stigma of addiction. We spent nine months last year working with a team at McKinsey and we studied 11 analogous social movements where change was created. And we pulled out what were the key success factors. And the action items that need to happen to reduce stigma, it's three simple things. It's educating in a certain way with people with lived experience, sharing their story with those without lived experience. And that sharing of story has to be one of two messages. It either has to be a story about themselves and successful recovery, and this is what I look like, and this is a treatable disease. Right. Not that it's a disease. Shatterproof was doing it wrong for a couple of years until we learned. We don't want to educate people it's a disease. Because you still don't want anything have anything to do with anybody who has a disease. You want to educate people it's a treatable disease. And I am, have been treated because there's evidence-based treatments at the same success rate as someone with diabetes, asthma, or heart disease. And here's what I look like. And I have a family and I go to church or synagogue or wherever I go. And I have three kids and I coach Little League. And this is what I look like. Well, it's information that leads to a solution, right? That leads to an action, right? It's not just information that's neutral. And we need I'd like, ooh, can I big, piggyback on you, Gary, for a minute about peers and what Avita brought up is that peers who have the lived experience and can meet with a patient, which we do in the ED, they have such a connection with people because they're sharing their life story, their lived experience about, look, I was where you were at one point in my life and now I'm here. And the person opens up to the peer more so than they would ever open up to the doctor in the ED or um, a social worker, or a licensed mental health counselor like I am. Peers are the key to success um, and we've proven that in Jacksonville with our Project Save Lives, with the overdose population, um, in the ED, meeting them and, and doing the warm handoff to a treatment provider so that they're being followed by the peers. And sometimes they don't even get into traditional treatment. They just have the peers be with them for two or three months or longer, depending on the person. And the success rate and the reduction in deaths is amazing out of since November of 2017, we've had 
um, 1,200 people that have consented to services and only six have died from an overdose where they were coming in over and over and over again into the emergency department. So you're right, Avita and, and Gary, that is the key. And I, I think you're really on to something when we need more of that in our addiction and mental health treatment. And 87% of the people who responded to our last poll felt that voluntary outpatient counseling which is what we're talking about. We're talking about people to people support groups, um, which is in itself a, an empowering act when you can talk about your own experience, share that with others and feel like you're having an effect. That is an empowering act. It's part of recovery. Uh, in, in helping others to recover, you're recovering yourself. Um, and and um, there, there are some other um, issues here that were, that were begged. Um, We've been asked uh, a question about, uh, and I guess uh, this, this deals with some of the issues that you're talking about, is, um, is it necessary to take a legislative approach uh, or a full-on federal approach of trying to shift policy in order to get us all rowing in one direction in this country to deal with some of these different issues, the disparities between physical and mental and addictive uh, health uh, treatments, the whole issue of, of rowing together. Gary, you were talking about the whole information problem and, and how that could actually resolve the resource allocation problem because it's logical to take a least cost solution than the high cost ineffective solution that we're taking now. Uh, what do you think? It, or is this the kind of thing where we have to have a federal kind of a federalist kind of a, an approach where each state does its own thing because each state is different. What do you all think? And, and you all represent these very different parts of America. What do you think? Davida, what, what do you think? Do you think there should be a national policy or a Texas-wide policy or just a San Antonio regional policy? I think the brain needs to be a part of the body, body last I checked, checked it was. was. And I think we're, having, we're having some difficulty with your audio. Oh, yeah. Um, let me let me talk with uh, with Gary and then uh, Candy and maybe we can we can get your uh, your audio back uh, in, in tune. Gary, um, what do you think? Related to transforming the treatment system and related to ending the stigma, it's a question. Uh, my answer is, of course, the federal government can help. Absolutely, but if we don't have to have the federal government. It's just going to take slower. Anytime you go state by state by state, it can be done, but it'll take a decade versus the federal government can help all of us get this done in a year or two much faster. Um, so that's, that's the answer. So maybe it's an organizing principle where you bring people together and you find a consensus and maybe it's not a coercive process of the federal government, but it's an organizing process. Candy, what do you think? Um, I, I would agree with Gary. I, having the federal government, they've been very helpful in the opioid crisis in the state of Florida. I'm assuming in New York and Texas also uh, in providing dollars for uh, treatment and outreach and prevention. Um, and it goes faster when you have the resources, which I'm sorry, it's always the funding, the money drives mm -hmm. the system. Um, so, but I think you have to have the feds as well as the state and as well as your individual community. Um, and because bureaucracy is hard to move quickly, as we all know. So I think sometimes the grassroots effort of the communities that get together, the providers that get together and say, okay, this is what we need to do. And then we, um, basically ask our legislators to help us do that by showing the results. There's got to be a return on investment um, if you're going to get funding from any philanthropist or governmental entity. And Avita, let's try you again. Can, um, oh, can you hear me at all? No? No, oh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, really, right. it's really poor. Um, we were just doing another poll, and we asked what people thought the leading cause of drug dependency was, and we forced everybody to pick one. And what's really interesting here is that stress and, and self-medication, which are points that you've all made, um, were, um, had about a third of respondents agreeing, as well as living in an environment where drug use is common and accepted. 
And then there were uh, other uh, pretty significant responses, biology, uh, lack of education on the, on the dangers of, of uh, taking drugs. What was interesting is we got zero respondents saying that the issue is lack of self-discipline. In other words, we seem to be shifting. Remember how people would say, oh, they're addicted to alcohol. It's their fault. They don't have discipline, right? They're, they're addicted to drugs. They don't have discipline. You would, you would victim blame it, or it, in many cases. It seems like we're, we're evolving uh, in part due to your efforts. How do we continue this shift? So, I, you know, my last point is, is that um, we have made progress. It's been slow, but we need to keep educating. We need to keep providing evidence-based practices. We need to keep, um, you know, working in our communities and really being out there and being vocal. I think that's, I, I think that's why things have changed. Because we started being more vocal uh, than we were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, when it was like, oh, if you have an addiction to mental health, you can't say anything to anybody. So we just have to keep doing more of that. And I think, you know, Gary's program and Avita's working with the youth. I mean, I think we're all really working in our own areas to make sure that it becomes more cohesive and that we make a bigger impact down the road. And Gary, how do you think we can, we can shift this? I, I know you have your own programs, but if you were to call everyone to action, what would your call to action be? Three things. Number one, when you say we have our own program, we don't, we don't run a treatment program. We're working on things behind the scenes. We're, we're working on transformable, transformational change for the entire system in the country. And so, to do so, we need to, we need to expand quick. We just launched in six states quality information. This needs to be in every state across the country. And whether we pick up a few states a year or we, or we get it all done in a couple of years and get this information out to families so they have it, that's what we need to do. There are treatment programs all across the country doing really good things, doing everything the right way. And there's many that aren't. And so we need to get this information out so everyone will see what needs to be done and just transform the system fairly quickly. Uh, number, and, and payment models will go with that because treatment that's based on quality is much less expensive with much higher outcomes for patients. Number two, I mentioned three things. Number two, stigma. We can do this over a couple decades or we can do it quicker. Um, people can learn about it. This is not a self-promotion, so go to any others who, if you want to do it. It doesn't have to be us, but we are building a national effort all on reducing stigma based on three things. Educating in a certain way, changing our language, and number three, change in policies. And then the third pillar is we need to get this information out to families so they understand it. People, if they have diabetes, they know enough. And if they don't know, they can go to their primary care doctor and he knows, he or she. But they don't know, but the people, our country doesn't know about this disease. So we need to give the information in consumer friendly language to families so they understand, and get, understand how to prevent and treat and recover from this disease. All doable, quickly, not over decades. Avita, I don't know whether you're, let, let's try one more time. Can you? No, we can't. We, we can't hear you. So let me let me just uh, um, make a point that I think um, you would you would want to make. Six percent, six percent of Americans over twelve suffer from uh, substance use and addiction. Six percent. If six percent of our friends and family suffered from cancer, we would want them to have treatment. We would want to address it. And you know something? 6% of our fam uh, family and friends are addicted and do use drugs. We just don't know it, maybe. But we will know it eventually. So that's what we need to do. We need to act as if that's happening today, because it is. Thank you all so much for, uh, for helping us to understand this really important problem. Avita, we're going to come back to you and we're going to do a, a, um, 
a uh, uh, nonprofit um, spotlight on your organization so that we ensure that that we can unfold your story. I'm sorry about the audio problems. That's part and parcel of uh, live television. So thank you so much, Candy uh, <laughs> Hodgkins, uh, Gary M Mandel, and Avita Morin for your insights on addiction. And uh, please everybody stay safe. That's the nonprofit report and have a great day. We'll see you on uh, Thursday. Mm -hmm.